welcome to the How-To Academy. My name is David Mullen, and it's my pleasure this evening to talk to Shilpa Rodella, who is a transplant gastroenterologist and also assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. And she's here this evening to talk to us about her new book, A Silent Fire, The Story of Inflammation, Diet and Disease. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us, Shilpa. Thank you so much for having me here, David. It's such a pleasure. Um, I suppose, first of all, we should, we should just explain to us how inflammation just is part of the immune system. Because I, I think when you think of the immune system, you think good. When you think of inflammation, you think well, not, not good. But they are part of the same thing, aren't they? Right. There are two sides of the same coin. So we've evolved these robust inflammatory responses to combat ancient killers like pathogens, poisons, and trauma. So in that context, our immune system is trying to fight these entities. The inflammatory response is a good thing. And if you stub your toe or uh, hurt yourself in some way, you can actually see the cardinal signs of inflammation, like redness, heat, swelling, and pain. And these are all good things happening in your body in that context to help heal the wound, fight the germs. But your, your book is about a different kind of inflammation. I think you, you sort of give it several names in the book, um, a low level inflammation. You, you rather wonderfully call it towards the end of the book, silent inflammation. Tell us what you mean by those and how it's different from what we think of as the inflammation you get when you get a bee sting. So we have evolved this immune response in a context that is very helpful for us, but there is a biological price to this. And you can see this with things you've heard of like autoimmune disorders, for example, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, you have this chronic inflammation. And this is sort of the dark side of the inflammatory response. Now, what we're finding is that there is also a kind of inflammation that is low level and silent. It just simmers through your body. You may not even know that it's there. And this is what I call hidden inflammation. And hidden inflammation is, is actually tied to a variety of our modern chronic disorders. Yeah, I was going to ask, is, to what extent is this silent inflammation um, a modern thing? Has it always been with us or is it something that's become more apparent with our, in, the, in the more modern world? It is certainly more apparent in the modern world. We have a rise in all kinds of chronic disorders and we are beset by things like heart disease, cancer, obesity, neurodegenerative disorders, diabetes, and we, we have a lot of chronic disease and we've also transformed our environments in uh, the way we eat our food, how we move, our social connections, and all of these things are exquisitely triggering for the immune system. So what happens is that the immune system mounts a low level of response to all of these triggers, and we have this silent, insidious inflammation that courses through our bodies, and it may manifest one day in the form of a heart attack that seems to come out of the blue, or a cancer diagnosis. Hmm. I mean, that's one of the really interesting things about the, the book is that you you sort of trace the history of how there was a real battle in science to to get scientists themselves to reconsider inflammation not just as uh, the effect of illness a consequence of being illness but in, but in an important way the cause of illness right absolutely i think because inflammation is so omnipresent, we are used to hearing about it in relation to every disease. And it is very often a consequence or a symptom of disease to see that inflammation is a cause of disease, an entity onto itself, mm -hmm. and to say that it can be a cause of, say, a disease like heart disease. That took a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, and scientists in the 19th century actually posited that inflammation could be a cause of heart disease, but it took over a century for this to be shown in clinical trials and for this to be investigated in basic science laboratories. Why was there so much resistance? Because the way you write it about in the book, I mean, obviously you're making it plausible in the way that you're writing, but it does come, when you read what you've written, you go, well, that makes sense. Why did it, why was there such resistance? Why did it take the better part of a century? 
I think the idea that so many different disorders from heart disease and depression to cancer and diabetes could have a common biological root is a somewhat fantastic idea. And we need very solid evidence in order to be able to say, you know, this is a root cause. It's not the only root cause of disease because chronic diseases are very complex, but it is a root cause. It is a central mechanism. And I think that idea is hard to stomach in some ways because these disorders are so different. We visit different specialties. If you have something wrong with your stomach, you see a gastroenterologist. If you have something wrong with your heart, you see a cardiologist. You know, uh, something wrong with your mood, you see a psychiatrist. And to think that we we should, in fact, be treating all of these disorders, not only in parts from specialty vantage points, but also in concert as a whole body, whole mind, addressing root causes is something that's somewhat of a paradigm shift now that we have the evidence to say that this could be a root cause of disease. Mm. Was there also part of it, something to do with the sort of the, the machine metaphor? It sort of comes up in your discussion about heart disease, that the, the sort of the, not an explicit metaphor, but one that's there in the back of scientists' minds, that, that it's a matter of plumbing that the arteries are basically like, the, like the, the copper pipes you have in your house for your, for your plumbing. And therefore, that they would be passive. So that if something goes wrong, it has to be an outside thing that's doing it. Whereas, right. whereas you're talking about the body itself, even well, what might seem like just a pipe, actually being an active participant in what's going on and could be the cause. Was that part of it, that sort of unhelpful metaphor, do you think? Right. And I think, you know, when I was in medical school, it was very easy to digest the information about heart disease. And, and it was very intuitive to think of cholesterol clogging up arteries and heart disease are the mechanics of heart disease. But what science has shown us over the years is that inflammation throughout the body can be a risk factor for heart disease. If you think about it, half of all heart attacks are in folks who do not have elevated cholesterol levels. And we know that ele elevated cholesterol levels are one risk factor for developing heart disease. Uh, but half of those are in folks without that. And so in inflammation is, as we know now, a risk factor for the causation of heart disease. But that was something that took a while to accept. And we have had large scale clinical trials now confirming this. In 2017, there was the Cantos trial done by Peter Libby and Paul Ritker at Harvard, and they showed that treating low-level inflammation uh, in folks could actually decrease the risk of heart attacks and strokes, and they treated them with an anti-inflammatory agent. Mm -hmm. So we know now that there is so much more going on in heart disease beyond just the clogged pipes. Uh, the joke back in medical school was that cardiologists are akin to plumbers uh, fixing up the clogged pipes, but we know that it's so much more than that. It's not just about putting stents in and doing invasive things. Uh, it's both. It's also about treating those root causes that uh, you know can, can cause an inflammation uh, uh, body-wide. Mm. It's also, I suppose, that when you're talking about treating the inflammation, in some ways that's more preventative you're, you're, you're taking actions to stop something going wrong whereas a lot of particularly 20th century medicine has been focused on what we do once it has gone wrong exactly so i think that's one of the big problems today with medicine is that we are trying to address the problem after it's occurred rather than trying to prevent the problem in the first place and you know with changes in diet with changes in lifestyle the majority of chronic diseases and death today are indeed preventable from cases of heart disease to cancer, to diabetes, to obesity, neurodegenerative disorders. So treating these root causes, treating inflammation, preventing it from occurring in the first place is incredibly important. So, I mean, um, I was, I suppose my, my, my father was a diabetic, so I wasn't entirely surprised when we came up with diabetes. But if you if you went back a few decades for someone to say, well, diabetes is an inflammatory disease, they go, wait a minute, what's it got to do with inflammation? It's just it's got to do with sugar. <laughs> right. But then right. You, you know, but then it is surprising when you start saying cancers, and you had some surprising 
and statistics and, and evidence to show the role of inflammation in cancer as well. Right. It's, it is very surprising. And we know, you know, for example, that inflammation has a potential to disrupt insulin signaling. So cells that are inflamed uh, are not uh, as responsive to insulin. And we know that the immune system and uh, metabolism, and metabolism refers to things like managing energy, uh, converting food into fuel, taking waste out of the body. These two systems were initially seen as totally separate entities, but we know now that they are intertwined and they actually co-evolved because defending your body against germs and managing energy uh, are both essential, crucial for survival. Uh, but there are so many different connections between the immune system and the me and metabolism now. And we know that inflammation may play a role in the causation of disorders like diabetes. And, and I, I was really surprised um, when you started talking about the, the role in mental disorders, because as you say, there was for such a long time the, the notion that there was never any correspondence between what went on in the rest of the body and the brain. The brain was just on the other side of some kind of Berlin Wall. And, <laughs> and you, 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 you make the point that inflammation has its own suite of cells in, in the brain as well. Right, exactly. And what happens in the body can affect the brain. We know that today, inflammation that happens in the body can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. And immune cells can actually cross that barrier. Immune cells can signal through the cells that are lining the blood vessels, and they can get into the brain and they can affect mood and cognition. Uh, when nerve cells are inflamed, the connections between them are less adept at learning and storing inflammation. Information. So we do know that a bodily inflammation absolutely affects the brain. And when you look at depression, for example, and you think about it in the context of the sickness behaviors, if you have an illness, if you have the cold or a flu, you really don't want to be around other people, you don't want to eat, you isolate yourself and the pleasures of life that used to excite you fail to excite you. And these are all behaviors that are very similar to depression. So here you have bodily inflammation that is actually influencing your mood. And we know today from studies that when you have this type of bodily inflammation, it actually affects parts of the brain on brain imaging scans that are involved in mood. Okay, so um, will I just be 100% happier and healthier if I just take a magic pill that stops inflammation? Unfortunately, I don't <laughs> think there's any... <laughs> Cure all, that would be great. And, and this also isn't to say that every single case of depression is caused uh, by inflammation because depression is a very complex disorder, but this is also to say that inflammation is a major player in psychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders today. It would be great if there was a magic pill, uh, but unfortunately hidden inflammation, silent inflammation, or even overt inflammation, these are all very heterogeneous uh, forces. But is it something that we just want to get rid of? I mean, is, it, is, is, infl is inflammation just a bit like the appendix? Used to be good when we were living in caves, now we just want rid of it. Or is there, is there an essential part to it even today? Well, we do want some inflammation in the body. And we all have, you know, just by having the mass of germs in our gut, we elicit some amount of inflammation. And we absolutely need some inflammation in the body in order to be able to defend against germs to fight poisons, to fight traumas, uh, heal wounds, and things like that. So we, we definitely do need some inflammation. So the question is one of balance. We want inflammation to come into our bodies, do its job, uh, fight those germs, and then die down as it should. We don't want the inflammation to turn chronic and low level, simmering in our bodies. Hmm. I mean, in some ways, um, I've never read a book where the the sort of the central character was called macrophage but <laughs> but this character macrophage pretty much is the star of your book i mean sometimes he's good and sometimes he's a villain um it, in some ways it's, 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 it, it strikes me like a police force you need them for clearing up troublemakers but the problem is sometimes they go rogue 
Right, absolutely. Um, and that's a great analogy. You know, and I did focus on the macrophage as a central character in part also because when you look at the interactions between food and germs, uh, lifestyle and the immune system and inflammation, you find that in chronic inflammation, uh, the macrophage is one of the major players in that type of inflammation. And so I really uh, do talk a lot about this sort of dichotomy. You know, you have the ability of macrophages to secrete cytokines and to help to fight the things that our immune system should be fighting. But when it's time for inflammation to die down and to resolve, the macrophages and uh, neutrophils and other cells, of course, too, switch gears and they actually secrete substances that reverses that inflammation. So there is this idea that, you know, this macrophage or inflammation in general, it's not black and white, uh, it's all, all good or all bad. And this, I would say, is analogous to most humans or so many different analogies in life that we can make. And, you know, in addition to the microbes in our gut, there again, you have a situation where it's very difficult to state here we have the good microbes and here we have the bad microbes. You know, it's more how are these microbes behaving in your body? And the amazing thing is that depending on what you can feed uh, the microbes, they change their behaviors. So depending on uh, your lifestyle factors, you can actually change the behavior of your immune cells, of your microbes. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much who they are, but what exactly are they doing in your body? Yes, you, you do characterize them. They do come as proper literary characters because you talk about mm -hmm. irritable macrophages and, and tolerant macrophages. And you talk about them getting all out of control. Um, and a lot of these are, as you say, to do with the signals which they're getting from what we're eating and um, and other things, you know, any germs that we're coming in contact with. But tell us, uh, uh, it, it's quite useful to get this uh, this notion of why a tolerant macrophage, a nice quiet one. How does it turn into an angry and irritable one? And why did you choose those terms? Because it's sort of key to what you suggest is the, the, the right kind of therapy, isn't it? Right. And it can also be a metaphor for the immune system at large. When you have an angry and excitable immune system that reacts badly to harmless things like dust and pollen and dander and is more prone to autoimmunity, that's a very big problem that we have in this world today because autoimmune diseases are on the rise. And our genes aren't changing that fast, certainly. So it's really the environment that's fostering this. And when you think about one of the biggest forces on the immune system, on the development of the immune system, it really is the microbes in your gut, uh, the mass of germs in, inside of your body. When you look at uh, germ-free mice, for example, who grow up in sterile bubbles, are delivered by C-section, these, these mice have zero germs on them. And they develop lots and lots of problems, a shrunken heart and lungs, uh, brain defects, and they develop immune systems that are very jumpy. They react very poorly to harmless substances, and they're much more prone to autoimmunity. And so from birth and throughout all of our lives, we need to be interacting with the right quantity and quality of microbes. And these microbes help to train immune cells inside of us. So these are the microbes that can train the macrophages in your gut to be more tolerant, to be more accepting of harmless food and germs, to learn how to distinguish the harmless foods and germs from their more toxic counterparts. And it's really invaluable for the body. Right. It's a bit like um, a community organization working with the police force. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, 